Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. Um, so, um, we've heard a lot this morning about some of the challenges we face. Um, many of those challenges require us to work across traditional academic disciplines. Many of those challenges present us with data sources that certainly qualify as big d data sources that challenge our abilities to manage, to analyze, and to infer patterns from those d data. And in the course of our discovery, many of us develop intellectual property um, that has a distinct value to society. And so this afternoon's session, or the first session this afternoon, um, deals with trying to meet those challenges. It's a session that we've called um, Addressing Grand Challenges Through Innovation, Collaboratories and Entrepreneurship. And we have two members of the panel to, to lead us through those discussions. Um, the first, um, Bill Cooper. Uh, Bill Cooper has a long and distinguished career um, as for, with a bachelor's from Allegheny College, uh, a master's degree from Penn State, and having raised a daughter who went to Penn State, I now know I have to say, we are. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's another one in the audience somewhere. There always is. Um, uh, after a, a, a few years of government ser service wearing a green u u uniform, um, Bill returned to academia where he was mentored during his PhD at Rosenstiel in Miami by our own uh, Mike R Roman. Um, and from there, he moved on to, uh, as I say, a distinguished career at the interface between environmental chemistry and civil en en engineering. Um, he moved in 2006 to UC Irvine, where he directed uh, the S Urban Water Research S Center. Uh, in 2011, he was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and in 2014, a fellow of the Association of Env Environmental Engineering and Science Professors. And then from 2013 to 2017, Bill was the Program Director for Environmental Engineering at NSF and led many innovative programs, including funding um, the report that, that Peter mentioned in his inaugural address, the Grand Challenges facing environmental engineering and science in the 21st century. Our second panelist is Jaap Gwadijk. Uh, Jaap joins us from the Netherlands, where he is scientific director of Del Deltares, which is an applied research institute uh, focusing on civil engineering, water resources, and flood management. Um, Yup works on a diversity of topics such as water and flood management, the consequences of climate change and sea level rise. Um, he does that work around the world, including countries such as Egypt, Iran, Mongolia, Hong Kong, and Suriname. And he, in addition to working at Deltares, he serves as a professor in modeling water management and climate at Twente University. And as Peter also mentioned, he was one of the pioneers at Deltares of uh, one of the first models um, to forecast floods in the coastal environment, the Delft Fuse model. So um, with that introduction for our two panelists, Bill is gonna take the, the podium first. Uh, we'll then ask Yup to come up and then we'll have a time for questions and answers with the audience. Thank you. All right, um, so it turns out they spelled my name wrong. I'm now Bill Copper, but that's okay. There's not a problem. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, uh, oops, we don't have, uh, oh, this, this is it here. Is this, no, is this the, and the green one. The green button. That, the big green one. There's a little green one with a light. Thank God I'm not colorblind. So the one thing they didn't tell you about my sordid past 
uh, was actually when I went to Allegheny, I actually flunked out of Allegheny um, and uh, then actually published two papers out of Woods Hole before I graduated with my bachelor's degree. So I redeemed myself working with a very famous organic geochemist, uh, Max Bloomer. Okay, so uh, you can see where I am here. Maybe most importantly is the fact that I still carry my UCI email. Uh, it's just wcooper at uci.edu. Um, and I'm also now working as a courtesy professor at the University of Florida. So I got, out of, uh, I got out of California because of the high personal income tax and went to a state that had no personal income tax in a little bit warmer too. Although it was 42 when I left the other day. Okay, so I'm trying to get this thing to go here. We'll try it one more time. Oh no, I'm hitting the wrong button. There we go. So we've heard a lot about convergence and this is the book that was published by the National Academy of Sciences uh, at about 2014 or so. And it talks about convergence. And I wanted to talk about that because um, Peter and I have had several discussions about UMSIs. And UMSIs, I think, as an organization has some challenges. But, you know, challenges always lead to opportunities. And so convergence is one of these things. And we, we we're talked a little bit about engineering versus science. I really have a hard time separating engineering from science. I think um, all good engineering, and I'm an environmental kind of engineer. Um, and when I was at NSF running the environmental engineering program, I got a lot of grief about the fact that I wasn't really an engineer. But I told all the other people that I'd actually run three pilot plants, and the one pilot plant that I ran was bigger than one that they'd ever run. So, that was, so I'm a pseudo-engineer. But what I really do appreciate is convergence. It's an approach to problem solving that cuts across disciplinary boundaries. And I think convergence is just a formalism of what we as environmental scientists in the broader context do every day. Um, as it mentioned, uh, Mike Roman actually taught me biological oceanography in 1980 when I was down at uh, of my first year in my PhD. Um, so environmental science, environmental engineering is really informed by good science. And the way of the future in my mind is coupling engineering with science where we have really good science to inform engineering. And engineering's not a, a magic, I'm not a concrete guy, I'm not a civil engineer, I'm an environmental engineer, if anything. And I think that's an important um, distinction. But nevertheless, at NSF we, f we found, in fact, when I, was when I was funding work, I funded a lot more science than I did engineering because it's my idea that nobody in environmental en engineering today is actually going to develop a new process without having a lot of science under that process. You're not going to know advanced oxidation if you don't know a little bit about free radical chemistry. And you're not going to know environmental, well, of course I was doing some, some playing around with, with the Native American tribe up in Northern California where they're actually putting uh, trees back into the, into the, the uh, Trinity River to actually improve the flow and increase depths where they can have actually the, the geomorphologist that was working had it all figured out. So that you put these things in, you actually ended up with deep holes, which were where the cold water was, and that's how the salmon would get up the river. Okay, so I didn't really have a clue what I was going to, to talk about, but you've cued me up actually quite well, and I'm not going to, I don't want to spend my whole 10 minutes, I'd rather an answer questions. But the 10 big ideas of NSF started while I was there at NSF. And in 2019, that's coming up, oh, actually it started, um, NSF is going to spend $30 million on each one of these 10 big ideas. And so one of the, the ideas is the future of work at the human technology frontier, which really builds on a program um, in NSF, which was uh, Human, human and Natural Systems, H and I forgot exactly what it was, but Human Technology Relationships. In other words, how do we take advantage of the human resources and technology that's available to us to catalyze interdisciplinary, and we can talk about interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary and all that nonsense, but those are only words. It's just a matter of getting the people together and working on solving 
big problems. And, and as we know, this is, a, is in many cases is what we call a wicked problem where there's no one solution and there's no one answer. And, and the target keeps moving. So one of the areas there is going to be the future of work and the human technology frontier. And interestingly enough, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking that, that one of the problems that I don't, it's not really a problem, but one of the problems that UMSIS faces is that there are no, there does, there's not an engineering department within that. And the first person that came to mind was actually Claire Welty. And darned if she wasn't on a panel this morning, because Claire and I worked a lot together when I was in environmental engineering. And I think that this, in having Claire here today, having been, she was very involved in LTER. She was very involved in a big sustainable research network on city waters. And that kind of relationship between people here and the Chesapeake Bay and Claire, because she's right over here at UMBC, um, I think is a natural marriage for the future. Oh, so, uh, let's see. What I did here, and, and I'm gonna, somehow these things are gonna be made available to you, but it's really easy to find. You just go into nsf.gov, and you just type in 10, 10 big ideas, or the big ideas, and they'll come up. And every one of the big ideas has a news release. In this case, it's 18-100. 18 refers to the fiscal year, 100 to the document itself. If you put in 18-100, you'll get the news release for the future of work and the human technology, and that will give you an idea of what that program is all about. And one thing you really need to do as investigators at universities is call your program director or get a group of people to go up to NSF and work with NSF. Um, because that's how you can make the biggest impact and, and find out if your ideas are really worthwhile, okay? Um, and not all NSF program directors are, are made equal. Uh, so some are much more receptive to, to you as faculty coming in and talking to them. And others are not so much. They'd rather, well, I'll give you an example. Bruce Hamilton, who runs the Environmental Sustainability Program, what he really likes you to do is to, pay, to send him a one-page description of what you're thinking about and then call him up or then email him. So everybody's got a different modus operandi over there, um, which makes, I think, NSF unique and a very nimble uh, area to, a place to work. Growing Convergence Research is uh, the DCL. DCL stands for a Dear Colleague Letter. That's how we get information out to you people. Well, we say, I say we, because I still think of myself as NSF. I was there for four years, but I haven't been there for a year and a half, but I still claim it as mine. Um, so these, this growing convergence, and that's why I wanted to show you this book. This book, really, for, for the people in this audience, convergence is something that we've lived with our entire life. We're almost all interdisciplinary by the mere fact we're either environmental scientists or marine scientists, either biologists or chemists or physical people, we always looked at interdisciplinary uh, teams. So I think that's really simple for us. But now this con growing convergence research, they're gonna put $30 million into this two minutes left talk. Um, <laughs> harnessing the data revolution, big data is, is huge. And it's only gonna get bigger. So um, get, some, get some statisticians and, and uh, math, math people with you and look at, at harnessing da the data revolution. Mid-scale research infrastructure. I think that's another one that's ripe for um, a multi-campus institution like UMSIS. I think that this is really good. In other words, it's, it's, more, than, it's more than what you would get for a, a, a large... Uh, equipment grant, but it's less than you'd get for, for example, an engineering research center, which is $20 million uh, for five years. Program solicitation for this one is 19-537. The 19 refers to the fiscal year. So 19 is uh, FY19, which started October 1. Navigating the new Arctic. I have a friend uh, at NSF and he says, Billy says, tell these people to look at navigating the new Arctic. We got $30 million and they're not getting any good, res they're not getting good proposals in that area. And I know there's a bunch of you that are doing work in the Arctic. So that's a really good hot topic. <laughs> we talked about that the other night. So, um, so navigating the Arctic um, is, is a good one. Um, 
And, and interestingly enough, it says establishing observing networks, which doesn't sound much like an NSF thing, but that's exactly what LTERs are, and that's exactly what a lot of things are, because those networks then lead to um, single investigator grants when you're coming up with, a, with a identifying a problem. Um, the NSF 2026, I'm not going to really talk about that. Um, hell, I might not even be alive then. Uh, NSF includes, of course, talks about diversity. You never know. <laughs> I would like to think I'm going to be, but I don't know. Um, NSF includes is transforming education in careers. Who are we talking to about education? And, and this, is, this is right there. That's a $30 million project up there. So there's, there's, your, there's your marching orders. Quantum leap. So I've done a lot of photochemistry and radiation chemistry, and I tell everybody that I've lived life in the excited state for a long time, so a quantum leap for me is no problem. It may be a problem for you, but in fact, actually, it's not that hard, particularly when you have a tunneling electron. Understanding the rules of life. This, I think, was brought up earlier this morning. Understanding the rules of life is, is, really, was, is really prime for you guys. Let me just talk about an i core. We talked about, somebody mentioned something about entrepreneur. It says, do you have an active NSF award or one that expired less than five years ago? If you are a principal investigator, a co-PI, a postdoc, or a senior personnel on the award, um, then you may be eligible for NSF's Innovation Corps, i -Core program. And this is, uh, over the course of seven weeks, scientists and engineers in i -Core programs will learn the value of customer delivery discovery, sorry, and how to identify commercial potential of their NSF-funded academic research. Now, I was just talking to Tom, I guess it was, that one of his students actually came up with a new discovery, and it got patented. We need to look at how UMSI's, I got zero, zero seconds left. Um, so at any rate, I have this information. There's going to be a telephone call on December 6th uh, at 2 p.m., yeah, G GMT minus four hours on Thursday, December 6th on this, on this topic. So I'll be here for the rest of the whatever it is, and then we can talk about this in detail. Thank you, Bill, and he didn't even mention butterflies. Um, so the next speaker, uh, Yap Gwadaik, uh, comes to us, as I said, from Deltares, and is going to talk about his experience from an international perspective. Yes, thanks, Tom. Um, everybody can hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, what, what I want to do here, I'm from Deltares, and want to do, I, I will not talk too much about our own research a little bit. I will talk about climate change and particularly sea level rise. Uh, of which I think that that will be the biggest challenge, I think, for the next X years. Um, and I will show you a bit how the Dutch deal with this, and I'm completely, con it's clear that the Dutch are a pretty small country, um, and uh, that it's, it's a very, very narrow perspective how we do it. I know that this, is not, this not, cannot be done worldwide, but just have, a, uh, have an idea of that, how we did this. Uh, well, short about Deltaris, um, it's, it's an independent research institute. We are with about 800 people. We have 110 million euros uh, uh, turnover. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization, which means that we are not allowed to make profit, but we can go bankrupt. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we have to earn for 85% our own money, um, uh, so we're not completely free to do everything that we want. Uh, we have uh, huge facilities. I'll show you one uh, in a minute. Uh, and we have a very, very strong dash to share and open source uh, policy. Um, and because, yeah, and one of the, the, the biggest, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, laboratories we have is this delta flume. It's 300 meters long, and Peter asked me to, to show it. And this is the opening of this uh, uh, two years ago. And this is the first wave that went through it. And on the right side, you see all the ministers, and they were happy to, uh, to be there. And the wave was a little bit higher than we thought. <laughs> an, an experimental way, uh, experimental flume, yeah? I mean, things can happen. And uh, well, it was uh, recognized in science. It was the most uh, cited, uh, downloaded paper that, that week, I think. And, uh, and actually, very last, last summer, we did a very interesting research in it. We, planted willows in this, uh, in this flume, 
uh, we generate a terrible wave through it to look what is the effect of these willows on dampening the waves, which was, as far as I know, the first one-to-one -one, uh, experiment of really, uh, um, let's say, nature-based flood defenses. And interesting enough, if we talk about diversity, uh, this was led by her. And realize, if I talk about diversity of coastal engineers in the Netherlands, they are men, Protestant, uh, raised by Delft, and uh, they work at Delft Hydraulics. That was on, until 15 years ago. Not really a diverse <laughs> group, but she is ecologist. Uh, and uh, let's say the older, uh, uh, it's, it's quite a shock for the older, let's say, coastal engineers that's, that she is leading the pack now, actually. Um, and she could have been here, but she couldn't come. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> Um, so this is, yeah, this is uh, where the Netherlands is, and if you look to the Netherlands, we are a bit, a rather small country. Dark blue is what is below sea level, light blue is not below sea level, but flood prone. Um, and if you do some uh, um, uh, nice 2D um, uh, hydrological, uh, hydraulic modeling, you can see what is the uh, expected depth if you, we have a flood, and that can be more than four meters. That is one side, and the, but the other side is this actually, and that is that we are extremely well protected. We think that we are protected against floods with a return period of 10,000 years. And we just uh, increased that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that standard to one in 100,000 years. Now, I'm not going to discuss if that is realistic or not, but this is more or less, uh, that this was the case, and this was the case, let's say, already 15 years ago. Um, and actually, in the whole, I mean, if we talk about climate change and, and sea level rise, it was really part of the, uh, the maintenance of our defense structure. It was in, put in the law how we should do it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we were pretty well prepared. Um, and then 2005 came, and this is New Orleans, and it showed that also quite reasonably well-developed countries could be hit by terrible weather. Um, and then in 2006, now look who's talking, Al Gore, and what he said, basically, well, before long, the Netherlands will look like this. Now, we did not believe the guy immediately, but we were a bit shocked because it might so that others would believe him. Um, and that would mean that people would think, well, the Netherlands is a bit small country, low. I'm not going to invest there. Now, that's a major threat. So what do the Dutch do? A commission. <laughs> Uh, and this was an interesting commission. Uh, it was a really interdisciplinary commission. There was only one civil engineer in it. And he was, uh, it was Marcel Stevie standing on the uh, last uh, row on the left. And the others came, economists, uh, someone, the, the center is the former minister of agriculture, and he led the pact. That was Case Veerman. And they found out they worked one year, only one year. Yeah? And they found out scientists do not agree on climate change and sea level rise. Okay. And they basically asked four questions in that year. First of all, what is the, he, they asked a very interesting question. They asked not so much what do the IPCC say about climate and change and sea level rise, but they asked what is the plausible maximum sea level rise you could think of in this century, between now and 2100. And I was in that group that had to say something about it. I was not for the, uh, for the sea level rise, but for the rivers. Uh, and we were put in a hotel. We got good food and drinks. And we were not allowed to come out before we came up with an answer. Uh, and after three days, we said, well, 1.30. <laughs> and after that, we uh, wrote an interesting paper in it. And it was, it was not published in Nature, but climatic change would lo lo love to have it. So that was the first question. And then they asked, they went to, he went around, and they, he, uh, they asked all the engineers, OK, are we able to defend the Netherlands to that rise? And the engineer says, yes, we can. What will it cost? Well, about one billion per year from now to 2100. <laughs> can we pay it? Yes, we can. OK, that's done. Discussion closed. Parliament agreed unanimously with the Delta Act in one year. That's leadership. So he achieved four targets, and that's very important, I think, for, for getting the things done. He had a law. He had a budget. He had a program that is uh, evaluated every year, and then the six years they have to, to rearrange it. And they had a commissioner that had the same level as the ministers. 
Now that's an interesting, so that's what we did so far. And interesting enough, how they sold this is simply that they say, look, one billion per year, it's a kind of insurance fee. It's only 1% of the GDP, and, and it's less than a one per mil of the invested infrastructure. So it's pretty cheap, uh, uh, let's say, uh, insurance fee. So that's how they sold it. So what helped in the Netherlands here? And that was to frame the cost of adaptation as an insurance fee. That was, that was really a good idea. Uh, to design measures, because that's in the program, that are beneficial anyhow. Uh, for, for the sake of climate change and sea level rise, nobody wants to invest. I mean, you need to have good, interesting measures that everybody's happy with. And to use a kind of planning method that approaches this not as an rather as an investment than as an environmental issue, and that's what we call adaptive planning. I'm not going to explain it if you want me to explain it later on with a beer or whatever. Okay, so far that was so far, but now two years ago, uh, it might be that things are going to change, and that's our current challenge, and that is this accelerated sea level rise. And that might be beyond adaptation or resilience. Um, Probably you noticed it, the Conte and Polar got their paper out two years ago in Nature, and they said it might be that Antarctica is less stable than we thought before. Um, and how does it work? Well, basically, Antarctica is a lot of ice. Um, if the whole thing, if whole of Antarctica would fall into the ocean, the, uh, the sea level worldwide would go up with 60 meters, 6-0. Um, and what is happening, actually, that this, this ice, um, it is the, the ice shelves around it keeps this ice a bit on its place. And it might be that these ice shelves could break down more rapidly, and that would lead to a, ra a reasonably rapid uh, flow of this ice into the ocean. Now, what's the evidence? It's the uh, polar and uh, uh, polar uh, uh, work. But it's also that we see these uh, ice sheets collapsing, and we see also that's a lot of more water there than we had expected. So what we did in uh, Deltaris, oh, is, and that she did, was we had a kind of hackathon where we put uh, a number of people, we put with 20 people together in a room, and we started to think, okay, what is one meter? What is two meters? What is four, six, eight, 10, 20 meters? What would it mean for the Netherlands? And then she made a very nice infographics, uh, and we published that. And, well, these were the, would be the consequences. After two meters, we would have capes. Um, in, in six meters, the, the, the delta is an estuary, uh, and you need an incredible number of pumps to pump all this water out, actually. Um, and what would it mean? Well, first of all, higher, earlier, and faster, the sea level rise. But also very much more uncertain. Well, we formally, we, we discussed, there were uh, strong discussions about centimeters. Uh, a few years ago, but now we have strong discussions about meters. Now that's a different discussion. Um, so, and this is, this is the, my, my main message. Time becomes incredibly crucial. Realize that if we have, here, the, you, what you see here is, suppose we would have something that would be beneficial for 50 centimeters of sea level rise, we would benefit it from 65 years if we would have implemented that in 1995. The next time that we do it, we only have 20 years, and the next time we only have 10 years. Now, that becomes really trouble. And to me, it's beyond imagination, because this generation could, may see two meters of sea level rise. That's a geological feature. So what's next? Well, mitigation is important. Uh, we need to try to, 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 uh, to slow down the process as much as possible. We have to monitor Antarctica. We need to know what is happening there. Uh, we need to have scenarios after 2100. The ice sheet doesn't know when it's 2100. Uh, and we need to have some impact in a plan B. But maybe, and we should consider accelerating sea level rise for investment for a long lifetime. And maybe I could plea here for an international Manhattan project. I guess that some of you know still what the Manhattan project was. <laughs> Not as secret as that one, maybe, but as big. <laughs> Um, but maybe the most pressing challenge for us, we should listen to Trump. Now, that's politically very incorrect here, I know. <laughs> but what is he saying? He says, you are worried about that climate change will devastate your world. And basically what he says, 
Well, I'm not afraid that it will devastate my world. And what I'm really afraid of is this, that, we, that sustainability, healthy environment, green growth, whatever, becomes a kind of toy for a very select few, and it's used to divide the society. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, your hand shot up at the beginning. Can you hear me? The uh, NSF 10 big ideas, the one about navigating the new Arctic. And I just want to say I don't want a new Arctic. I want the Arctic to stay frozen. And um, I'm wondering in, in that if there's room to, for research that will suck the carbon out of the sky and send it to the bottom of the sea, really working at changing our, um, uh, controlling the climate that we're doing a really poor job at, understanding the Earth's system where it already sequesters carbon, using our natural, our understanding of natural processes to uh, do a Manhattan Project. Science the shit out of this problem, because I think the only true answer is to arrest sea level rise. Um, I, at least for Dorchester County, where Horn Point is, uh, retreat is um, to lose so many people's homes and lives. I, uh, so I feel very strongly that um, the National Science Foundation, much like NASA led us to space in the last century, the National Science Foundation is the place where there is this incredible interdisciplinary collaboration, big money, and the power to re yeah, really science the shit out of this problem that we have and come up with a way to uh, reverse sea level rise and global climate change. Thank yes, you. I don't think there's anybody... No, it'll come on in a second. I, I don't think there's anybody in NSF that would disagree with you. Um, but I think also navigating the new Arctic, uh, it, even if, even if we did everything possible right now, we're still talking about a leg of 20 or 30 years from today uh, with the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So we really do have to, and, and, and this gets back to, I don't listen to Trump at all, but um, it, it gets back to we're at a point where if we don't, as a collective society, say, listen, and this is, and the way to do this is through your own legislators, not through the, the federal government. But, but we, have to, we, we have to fight climate change, carbon dioxide, the increase in carbon dioxide, at every juncture. And I don't think there's a way, and I'm not a climate change scientist. I actually know who wrote that, uh, and it got, it got changed a little bit. But um, I think the thing is, is that navigating the new Arctic, so let's just say, you want to do some work in the Arctic. The first thing you need to do is you need to find somebody that will listen to you at NSF and you give them your ideas or write a, a one-page paper and then say, this is what I propose to do and get it up to somebody. Um, I know Carl Rockney in environmental engineering who took over my position is very interested in climate change. He's on the climate change, the navigating the new Arctic program, Carl Rockney. Um, and... Um, I think it's krockney at nsf.gov, but you can look up the Environmental Engineering Program and you'll get his email. I would call him up. He, he told me to tell you guys, listen, we got $30 million in the navigating the new Arctic and we're not getting a lot of, pub we're not getting a lot of um, proposals. So to do that, I like the high ground that you're taking. I'm not sure it's realistic uh, from, a real, from a real life point of view, but I think I totally agree with you. So... Um, the Haber-Bosch process for nitrogen fixation changed the game for the human population. And I think we need a game changer now. And so, I'm just, I think yeah. that, um, I don't know if... Yeah, so I agree with yeah. you. In fact, actually, there's a program in CBET, Civil Biochemical Environmental and Transport Systems, that's where I was, that does, that's looking at new and different ways to do the Haber-Bosch. I mean, the Haber-Bosch takes up something like 10% of all the electricity, the energy in the United States. It's huge. And what does it do? It gives us, it gives us nitrogen for free and to screw up our environment. 
So there's a lot of people that are looking at that. But you know, this is, these, this is why it's a wicked problem. I mean, if you go back to Lake Erie, getting away from the Arctic, go to Lake Erie, the western basin of Lake Erie. So I did three cruises on Lake Erie with, with the Canadian scientists. And, and in the early 2000s, we had Lake, Ontario, or Lake Erie was clean. Then what happened is we had a change in agricultural practices where they in, implemented these drainage, these drain fields, and those drain fields drain the, the nutrients and stuff right out of the soil, right into the rivers. They're a non-point source. They're not regulated by the Clean Water Act. The nitrogen concentrations and the phosphorus concentrations went up. The microcystins bloomed, and Detroit was, out, was without, or not Detroit, uh, a city in Ohio was without uh, uh, drinking water for a day because they couldn't figure out what to do with the microcystins toxins. So these are big problems. That's why they're labeled big problems. And what I'm challenging you as a faculty member or whatever you are, what are you, are you a faculty member here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was just assuming you were, but you as, a faculty, <laughs> as, as a faculty member, it's, it's up to you people to look at those big challenges, those big problems, and figure out how can we as a group put them together. That's why I think that mid-level, um, the one that I showed you is mid-level infrastructure or something like that. I mean, this is where UMSEs has got it over anybody else. You've got the Appalachian Lab, you've got Hornpoint, you've got CBL, um, and, and they're all working, and, you, and it would be a great place to try to look at some of these complex. So, can I just interrupt this for a second? Sure. You've got two models here of how science is done, right? You have a, effectively an a, almost an a institution specific for a pro problem, mm -hmm. and now you've got a funding agency which is looking for problems. So how do, how do we put those two together? What's, what, what's the way we leverage both of those models? Is, is it necessary to have a single vision like Deltares has? Well, Deltares was formed in the Netherlands um, from a number of institutes simply because what the, government, what the, the Dutch government said, look, this is, uh, let's say, the, the research, applied knowledge, applied research for, for saving us against flooding is strategic. We need to keep that, and we don't want to give that to, uh, let's say, either, uh, uh, let's say, the market, which can be, if you, are, if you don't have any work for a while, there will, no, there will be no people anymore yep. that, are, uh, that know this, that have the experience, and also not entirely on the, uh, on the universities, because in the end, the universities, they need to publish, they need to do great science. Right. which is not always, uh, which doesn't, sometimes doesn't help to keep your feet dry. Yep. Yeah, and, and, um, yeah, yeah, and I think that, uh, that indeed, I mean, for us, I mean, the Netherlands is pretty, I mean, you could compare it with maybe Maryland or something, the Netherlands. I mean, and, and we talk about NSF, I mean, that's the whole United States. That's, that, that's really different in size, I guess. Right. I, I don't think you should have one group of that for that. No. Okay. Yeah, NSF is not the only funding agency out there to do climate change. The, the right. Department of Energy is doing a lot of work. And, um, and one, of the, one of the federal agencies, groups, that is the most scared about climate change is the, the Navy. Military. Yeah. Uh, and military in general, but Navy for sure, yeah. because you've got Norfolk, you've got San Diego, and all of those places are going to be underwater in a not too distant future. Well, sadly, we've run out of time. I take it by Dave <laughs> standing. I thought we had till ten. On, I thought we had till ten o'clock tonight. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought so too. But there you go. Um, so uh, I ask you to join me in thanking both of our panelists. <laughs>